Okay, dear colleagues and friends, I think we can uh, start the day. Um, it's an important day for us, for, us, for, uh, for the Commission, for ECFIN. Um, it is uh, the flagship, uh, Basel Economic Forum, the flagship initiative uh, of uh, DG ECFIN. Uh, and uh, this year in particular, we have, a, I think, a very exciting uh, program. Um, it is the 16th edition of the Brussels Economic Forum, so we have a, we have a track record. Um, and we have decided this year to innovate, and I welcome you all in this beautiful uh, um, hall in Flyge's uh, landmark building. Um, and welcome also those who are following the event via um, web stream. And my welcome extends also to the more than 100 journalists who have joined us for this uh, on record uh, uh, event. Now, a few words on housekeeping to start with. Um, the main room uh, is here. When it's full, uh, um, there are two additional rooms on the ground floor, uh, Studio 1 and 5, where our discussions can be followed on large screens. Um, put your uh, mobile phones in silent mode, but don't switch them off. Uh, one of the new features of the forum uh, this year is that we would like uh, uh, to be as interactive as uh, possible with discussion also on the uh, social, uh, social media. Um, as you can see on the screen here, um, we have a Twitter wall, wall um, on which uh, you will be able to see some of the tweets which are being uh, posted on the topics uh, under, under discussion. Um, so I would encourage you, those who wish to do so, to tweet using the hashtag uh, EUBEF2016. Uh, so EUBEF2016. Now, on today's uh, uh, program, uh, a few words. I think we can summarize uh, the inspiration for the program today in three numbers. Uh, two and a quarter, one and three quarter, and one percent. These are the estimates of potential growth uh, at the end of the 1990s, in the mid-2000s, uh, before the crisis, and today. I think it is uh, well established that uh, without policies to boost uh, potential growth, our economies cannot ensure uh, the preservation, uh, the renewal of uh, our social uh, model and sound uh, public finances. Um, some of you uh, asked me uh, why um, structural reform 2.0 in, in coming in. I mean, there are many several reasons for, uh, for this. Uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, we see structural reforms as part of the three-pronged strategy um, that has been endorsed by the G20, uh, together with uh, monetary policy, let's say fiscal policy, so the third leg is indeed uh, structural reforms. Um, so we see this as part of this uh, um, consistent uh, economic policy challenge. So not structural reform, prêt à porter, uh, ready to uh, solve all problems as part of a, of a consistent policy agenda. The second element is the social dimension of structural um, reforms. I think the issue of uh, inequality fairness uh, has acquired a very important uh, uh, very important dimension uh, in the formulation of uh, uh, economic policy and also in structural reforms. So one has to acknowledge this and design and implement structural reforms to cater for uh, uh, concerns about uh, fairness uh, and, uh, and inequality. The third element is uh, also the more positive message on structural reforms, not only the hardship, but also the positive accompanying messages, so the focus on uh, innovation, R&D, uh, all those matters which are uh, very important to boost the productivity, total factor productivity uh, looking forward. So 2.0, I think these are uh, some of the uh, reasons why um, we put the emphasis uh, uh, on this. And uh, growth and jobs investment, I think, are the name of the game in the discussion uh, uh, today. 
also the uh, panel on completing economic and monetary union is, uh, can be seen in this light. It is important to increase certainty uh, for investors looking forward, so to elicit uh, uh, um, proper response and to boost, uh, and to boost investment. Uh, on this reference will be made also to the Juncker plan on investment, which is now in uh, full uh, in full swing, and with the investment uh, being seen both as a demand component, so to, to push domestic demand, but also from the supply side component as uh, um, uh, part of the production function of the European economy, uh, so boosting growth uh, in. Uh, uh, in the medium to long to long term. We are going to look also at the experience with adjustment programs. I think here, uh, I hope what will come out of the discussion is, the, okay, on the one hand uh, that we have some success stories, usually uh, the problems are highlighted more than uh, uh, the, the successes. And second, I hope it comes out that uh, as part of the adjustment programs, it was not only, I would even say it's not even mainly the austerity issue, but it is uh, the renewal of the economies and the strong emphasis on structural reforms uh, as part of the, uh, of the program. So this is the uh, agenda of the day, but we start uh, um, with uh, the, one of the highlights uh, of the day, which is the Tommaso Padoa Schioppa uh, lecture. Um, which uh, is uh, going to be uh, given this year by the EC pre ECB President Mario, uh, Mario Draghi. This is the fifth annual, uh, uh, annual lecture dedicated to the memory of, uh, uh, of Tommaso uh, at the Brussels Economic uh, Forum. Uh, uh, this has been come, uh, a tradition. Uh, it is uh, held in honor of one of the founding fathers of the Euro, and also, uh, I always recall, um, a former director general of DG Ecfin, you remember DG2 uh, at the time, who passed away in December 2010. I mean, he contributed decisively to the vision, design, launch of the Euro. He was a central figure in running the Economic and Monetary Union as a member of the board of the of the ECB. I mean, in his this, in this last year, he supported the, the strengthening of economic governance to get financial stability uh, as a response to the financial economic crisis. I remember also uh, his uh, spell as uh, um, finance uh, minister of Italy and uh, what he used to say um, coming to the, um, to the Eurogroup. So he was finance minister between 2006 and 2008. He was saying that uh, when I come to the meeting of the Eurogroup, I always wear two hats. The national one, obviously, representing his, uh, uh, his country, but also the European, uh, European hat. And uh, I have to say, I would like to see uh, more uh, Eurogroup ministers uh, wearing two hats uh, when we have uh, our, uh, our discussions. Um, I recall that the, the previous lecturers uh, uh, were uh, Germany's finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, Italy's former Prime Minister Mario Monti, uh, the former WTO Director General Pascal Lamy, and also the former EU Council President Herman uh, Van Rompuy. I mean, on uh, Tommaso, uh, he has been associated uh, to the project of the Euro in general, and to also to some specific uh, um, elements. I mean, I would like to recall uh, um, what he dubbed the inconsistent quartet, which is one of the elements uh, at, the, uh, at the basis of the, uh, of the Euro and EMU. So essentially, um, the proposition is that one cannot have, uh, at the same time, fixed exchange rates, free capital movements, independent monetary policy, and this is the inconsistent trio of Mandel, but he added also the single market. So this inconsistent quartet, uh, is important is at the basis of uh, um, preserving um, uh, growth and integration uh, in Europe and uh, I think solve the uh, dilemma by pooling, uh, let's say, monetary uh, sovereignty. Uh, Tommaso was uh, um, Director General at the Commission between 1979 and 1983. I fished back uh, his 
handover report uh, that he did when he finished uh, he moved back to Rome to the bank to the Bank of Italy which is a beautiful document uh, it is uh, written in uh, in beautiful uh, beautiful French and he recalls there his uh, experience and the state of the uh, European economy and the economic and policy challenges uh, at the time and if I pick up what uh, he lines up at the beginning of the document uh, says this is, has been a period with uh, important manifestations uh, say, of dynamism, uh, community dynamism, maybe it was the creation of the ERM, he has been an architect of that as well. The um, uh, European economy uh, and, the, and the world economy uh, at the time were living, uh, he recalls, uh, a long period of stagnation and low growth. The orientation of, of uh, economic policy changed uh, notably in a number of uh, European countries following uh, changes in, uh, um, in the political orientation. Very interesting, it indicates that at the time um, in almost all the countries of the Union, changes in government have become more frequent and very often determined, uh, triggered by uh, questions of political economy. I recall also that there was at the time la querelle sur la question britannique, uh, which dominated the debate uh, uh, during that, uh, uh, a large part of that period. Sounds familiar. Hmm? Um, now, what was the, his diagnosis uh, uh, having lined out these various challenges? Um, maybe I read it in French uh, just to be, uh, to be faithful to, uh, to the author. Uh, la communauté, quant aux objectifs ultimes qui lui sont assignés um, par ses fondateurs, est sur la défensive des plus plusieurs années. Malgré les projets réalisés, la simple affirmation des objectifs politiques ultimes n'est généralement tolérée que si elle prend forme, la forme d'un appel rhétorique. L'intangibilité de la souveraineté nationale est redevenue un dogme. Ces dogmes paralyse la communauté dans sa vocation à la dynamique. Cette paralyse déforme la communauté, cette déformation est à son tour invoquée comme un argument supplémentaire contre le vieux projet d'intégration politique. I think this assessment here, um, I think resonates well um, considering the policy challenges that we have uh, uh, today. Now, fast forwarding to today then, uh, I venture, I'll say, in postulating a new um, uh, Tommaso-inspired, uh, uh, inconsistent, let's say, political uh, uh, trinity, uh, saying that uh, one cannot have, uh, at the same time, Europe taken as a scapegoat systematically in national debates, first, second, decision-making which is compatible with uh, subsidiarity at the different uh, levels, and third, national political stability intended as uh, preventing the emergence of populist tendencies. We cannot have uh, these three elements at the same time. And obviously the solution, uh, um, Padoa Scopa compatible solution here, would be not to take uh, e, uh, Europe as the scapegoat in national debates and show that what is decided in uh, uh, Brussels collectively is then uh, consistently applied uh, and promoted also when uh, leaders go back uh, home. His own conclusions was that the many difficulties in our societies are not caused by Europe, but it is the lack of Europe that makes them more acute and eventually insurmountable. The cause is not the union with a capital U, but the lack of union with a small U. Europe is the place of the illness. The union of Europe is the remedy. This comes from the, uh, his uh, Altiero Spinelli lecture at the University of, Tur of Turin on 17 January 2007. And uh, this is uh, republished uh, in a, a beautiful collection of papers by Tommaso, edited by his brother Antonio Padua Schioppa, who is uh, here today. And uh, I thank him very much for having uh, decided to join uh, us in the memory of, uh, uh, of Tommaso. So these were my uh, initial words. Um, 
I'm very pleased that uh, Mario has been, uh, who has been at the helm of the ECB since 2011, has accepted to be with us today and to hold the fifth annual Tommaso Padua Schioppa uh, lecture. So, Mario, it is a true privilege to have you here, here with us today. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I'm thankful and honored by this invitation. Tommaso and I uh, first met, uh, crossed uh, each other's paths uh, in the mid-70s when we were both students of Franco Modigliani at MIT. And uh, when I returned to Italy later on, we started a, I would say, I would call it a lifelong relationship of work and collaboration. As, as Marco just said, we all owe him a great debt, gratitude, as to one of the fathers of the Economic Monetary Union. And this lecture is a proper tribute to his legacy. In a speech in Vienna last week, I explained why monetary policy could deliver the appropriate stimulus, level of stimulus to the economy, even in a setting where interest rates are close to their effective lower bound. As inflation is ultimately a monetary phenomenon, a committed central bank can always fulfill its mandate. And that is true independently of the stance of other macroeconomic policies. But monetary policy does not exist in a vacuum. The situation of central banks is better described as independence in interdependence, since other policies matter a great deal. They can buttress or dilute the effects of our policy. They can slow down or speed up the return to stability. And they can determine whether stability is accompanied by prosperity, which is directly relevant to the social cohesion of the euro area. It is these interactions and why they matter that I would like to talk about today. The objective of the ECB is defined as delivering a rate of inflation below but close to 2% over the medium term. But the medium term is not a fixed period of time. When faced with adverse shocks, the pace at which monetary policy can bring inflation back to the objective depends on two factors, the nature of the shock itself and the conditions in which monetary policy operates. Some types of disturbance will inevitably depress inflation for longer than others and make the return to the objective slower. The recent succession of global oil supply shocks is a prime example. In that context, the job of monetary policy is not to fight short-term shocks to prices, but to prevent them from feeding into longer-term inflation dynamics. Or put another way, it is to make sure that the effect of shocks on inflation is no more persistent than it needs to be. So when we talk about returning inflation to our objective without undue delay, this is what we mean. The return to price stability should take no longer than implied by the nature of the shocks we are facing. But this is not entirely dependent on our actions due to the second factor, the conditions in which we operate. Monetary policy can act decisively to support demand, to stabilize inflation expectations, and to avert second round effects on wages and prices, which is exactly what the ECB has done 
over the past two years. But the orientation of other policies also influences the speed with which output returns to potential. So if other policies are not aligned with monetary policy, inflation risks returning to our objective at a slower pace. There are a number of policy areas that matter in this regard. First, for monetary policy to stock demand and inflation, it matters crucially whether the financial system is able to relay our policy impulses efficiently to the economy. In the euro area, that transmission mechanism has been impeded repeatedly in the past, initially by rising risk premia linked to unwarranted fears about the survival of the euro area, and later by widespread bank deleveraging. That has diluted the effectiveness of our stimulus and lengthened the long and variable lags over which monetary policy works. We have compensated for this by designing our measures to remove transmission blockages, as well as including an asset quality review in the comprehensive assessment of bank balance sheets that we launched in 2013. Both measures have helped ease financing conditions, as we can see in our bank lending surveys. But bank balance sheets have not yet been fully repaired, as illustrated by the high stock of non-performing loans in some parts of the euro area. So more work out of these non-performing assets will have, must take place. And the conditions for that will have to, put, to be put in place by right policies and authorities. But there are other factors as well that interact with monetary policy. And the second one is that whether fiscal policy is steering aggregate demand in the same direction and how strongly. Fiscal policy was contractionary for several years in the euro area following the loss of confidence in sovereign credit in 2010. And the negative effect on growth was exacerbated by the fact that consolidation in some countries was implemented mainly through tax rises rather than current spending cuts. This placed the full burden of macroeconomic stabilization on monetary policy. And in a context of disrupted transmission, that has led to a slower return of output to potential than if fiscal policy had been more supportive. This is why the ECB has said many times that fiscal policy should work with, not against, monetary policy. And the aggregate fiscal stance in the euro area is now slightly expansionary. But supporting demand is not just a question of budget balance, but also of its composition, especially the tax burden and the share of public investment. So we shouldn't see fiscal policy as solely a macroeconomic tool, which is only available to countries with strong public finances. We should also see it as a microeconomic policy tool that can enhance growth, even when public finances need to be consolidated. Third, it matters for monetary policy whether the right structural policies are in place. Structural reforms can help limit the depth and duration of shocks, which in turn supports the anchoring of inflation expectations and keeps the real rates low. Such reforms can also reduce the transmission lag of our measures since a more flexible, more responsive economy is likely to transmit monetary policy impulses faster and they produce higher potential growth, which leads to higher investment, and hence a higher equilibrium real interest rate. 
That creates the conditions for the central bank to return to conventional interest rate policy as the means to deliver price stability. In the euro area, many structural reforms have been implemented in recent years, and especially in those countries worst hit by the crisis. The benefits can now be seen, but there are many more benefits still to aim for, and so much more, much more needs to be done. There is one final element that interacts with monetary policy, and that's the uncertainty over the institutional stability of the euro area. This can slow down the transmission of monetary policy. Firms that lack sufficient visibility over their operating environment over the years to come may understandably choose to deter or even abandon investment plans. That is especially so when the return on these investments depends strongly on the size and openness of the market provided by the euro area and by the European Union. This has been clear in the past when the future of the euro area has been called into question. And that sort of uncertainty not only impacts on firms that borrow to finance real investment, it can also affect the saving rate of firms and households as the perception of a higher risk can call for higher precautionary savings. This would obviously run against the efforts of monetary policy to stimulate higher investment and higher consumption. So I will only note once more the critical need to restore clarity and confidence on the institutional setup of the euro area. We know that the current setup is incomplete. There is a large degree of agreement on what its shortcomings are, and many proposals have been put forward on how to overcome them. Progress in this field is necessary for the long term, but it's also relevant for the short term because of its effects on investment. Indeed, perhaps the best way to raise output today is to remove the drag on confidence that results from such uncertainties. Summing up, there is a large degree of interaction between monetary policy and other policies that may, in principle, be geared towards different objectives. Such interactions do not prevent a determined central bank from achieving its objective, as I said before. But they do affect the time frame over which we can do so. What this implies is that for stabilization to occur no more slowly than it's strictly necessary, all policy areas have a role to play. And in fact, all policymakers should have a strong motivation to do so because time matters. A too slow return of output to potential is far from innocuous. On the contrary, it has lasting economic consequences since it can ultimately lead to potential, potential output being eroded as well. It's well documented, for instance, that workers who remain unemployed for too long may suffer the effects throughout their life in the form of reduced employability, reduced productivity, reduced income. That's the so-called hysteresis. That is particularly true for younger workers who are unemployed during the all-important formative years of their careers and may suffer from labor market scarring. In the euro area, structural unemployment is estimated to have risen during the crisis while youth unemployment remains high. There is also emerging evidence that growing below potential for too long can erode that potential through its effects on productivity growth. 
When uncertainty is high, a wait and see attitude can cause the most productive firms not to expand as much as they would otherwise, and the least productive firms not to contract as much as they should. In other words, and contrary to what is often claimed, too weak demand can slow down creative destruction, whereas stronger demand can accelerate it. And there are signs that of such effects in the euro area too. The cost of delay then is that labor and productivity suffer and the output gap closes in the wrong way. Instead of output rising towards potential, it's potential that falls towards current output. So it is, in fact, in everybody's interest to act without undue delay. For the ECB, this means that we do not let inflation undershoot our objective for longer than is avoidable, given the nature of the shocks we face. For others, for other actors, it means devoting every effort to ensuring that output is returned to potential before subpar growth causes lasting damage. And given the harm that has already occurred to potential growth during a crisis, it also means acting decisively to raise potential. While keeping output close to potential is about the right policy mix, raising potential is above all about structural reforms. This ultimately comes down to two factors, employment and productivity. And in both areas, there is considerable scope for the euro area to raise output with determined reform efforts. In terms of employment, we know that the euro area faces a long-term drag from its unfavorable demographics. But even accounting for that, I see a substantial leeway to lift output in the euro area by exploiting the other margins which determine employment. First, by reducing the trained unemployment rate, which remains too high in many countries. And second, by raising participation rates, which are still short of international norms in several jurisdictions. Reducing trend unemployment is in part about reversing the hysteresis effects I described above, but it's important to remember that the crisis only added to an already troubling picture. Structural unemployment in the euro area was estimated at around 9% even going into the crisis, compared with just 5% in the United States. This is a consequence of structural features of euro area labor markets, which have been ratcheting up unemployment over successive cycles. And it implies that there is a large latent potential in the euro area labor force, which can be unleashed with appropriate labor market and activation policies, and more so than in other advanced economies. Experience during the crisis has demonstrated how such reforms can work. Reforms implemented by, the, by Portugal under its adjustment program are estimated to have reduced the unemployment rate by around three percentage points over the 2011-2014 period. Likewise, the Spanish labor market reform in 2012 has been a factor supporting employment growth since then. This should give encouragement to reforming countries to continue their efforts, and in particular those where, where, where high unemployment has persisted for so long that has, it has been allowed to become a social norm. But the challenge is not just moving people from unemployment into employment. It's also raising the size of the workforce 
which is where the participation rate comes in. Though the euro area fares quite well in international comparisons, participation rates in some member states remain relatively low, if not too low. With roughly 15 percentage points difference between the best and the worst performers. This implies that there is also a latent potential to raise employment on this margin with the right structural policies. For example, we've seen participation rates of older workers grow strongly during the crisis, due in part to pension reforms adopted in many Euro area countries. Still, despite this untapped reserve for accelerating employment growth, we cannot avoid the fact that over time, the inherent speed limits resulting from the Euro area's unfavorable demographics will start to bite. The Euro area's working age population is projected to start gradually decreasing in the next decade. In that context, employment growth is likely to start decelerating in the not too distant future. Even with determined structural reforms, as a, high share, a higher share of people in work will no longer be able to offset the fall in working age population. Even higher expected migration is unlikely to be able to fully offset this natural population decline. Public policy can certainly help temper these effects through its role in receiving and integrating migrants. But since policy cannot do much to alter long-run demographic trends, the implication is that raising long-term long growth will require a complement, namely raising productivity, which is difficult. It does require a broader set of reforms, and these reforms typically encounter greater resistance from vested interests. That is why many countries have found it easier to reform the labor market than other areas during the crisis. And indeed, repeated attempts since the turn of the century to make, to make Europe, as they used to say, the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world, do you remember these words, have produced only meager results. Given the weak outlook for Euro era growth, however, tackling the productivity challenge can no longer be delayed. Broadly speaking, productivity growth comes through two channels. The first is within firm growth, which depends on the generation and diffusion of new innovations and management techniques. The second is across firm growth, which depends on the movement of resources from the least to the most productive firms. The Euro area's comparatively weak performance derives from both. Indicators on research and development suggest that the Euro area is lagging behind in terms of innovative capacity, and particularly in the services sector. Indeed, the diffusion of information and communication technology appears to have contributed much less to services productivity growth than in the United States. And this accounts for much of the weaker productivity performance of the Euro area since the mid-1990s. At the same time, employment in the Euro area is undergoing a secular shift from manufacturing to services. And this has only been exacerbated by the pattern of job creation since the crisis. Such shifts are, of course, taking place in all advanced economies. But since productivity growth in the service sector is often lower in the Euro area, it constrains our aggregate productivity even more. Yet, this picture is not necessarily a cause for pessimism. For a start, it does suggest that there is quite some scope for productivity catch-up through adopting digital technologies. So, 
The debate is currently raging in the United States among United States economists about whether the great waves of technological innovation are now over is for the time being less relevant for the Eurozone. For the Euro area, the key question is how to create the conditions for more firms to move towards the productivity frontier. What is more, the secular shift from manufacturing to services can be consistent with higher productivity if resources are well allocated. In fact, there are very large differences between the most and the least productive firms within each sector, even more so than across sectors. This implies that even in a services-oriented economy, aggregate productivity can still be improved. So the euro area faces a twin policy challenge to get more firms in each sector to the productivity frontier and to get more labor and capital to those productive firms. And crucially, this will not only boost output, but also employment and wage equality, since labor would be concentrated in firms that are both growing and demanding higher value skills. To achieve this, there are, in my view, three policy priorities. First is addressing the structural barriers to knowledge diffusion in Europe. This has many facets, but critical are policies that increase trade openness and facilitate firms' participation in value chains, as well as a competitive business environment that favors the adoption of superior managerial practices and organizational structures. The most powerful quick win we could make here would be to complete the single market, especially in services since that would automatically accelerate diffusion from the European frontier, where we already have many world-leading industries. For firms to integrate effectively into the single market, however, they need to be able to scale, which is why the second priority is to create the conditions for the most productive firms to expand quickly and attract resources. This depends on well-functioning products and labor markets, a financial system that channels capital to dynamic firms, and policies that prevent resources from becoming trapped in unproductive firms, such as efficient judicial systems and sound bankruptcy laws. Change of that nature creates opportunities but it can also be perceived as threatening for individual workers. So, a so inadequate social safety nets have to be in place as well. That is also why the third priority is improving human capital. This would benefit workers who gain higher pay due to better matched skills. And it would benefit productive firms by reducing the skill mismatch that constrains their growth. Making progress in this area comes down primarily to education, but also labor market reforms such lifelong learning schemes and removing labor market dualities could also make an important contribution. For instance, by providing greater opportunities for both younger and mature workers to gain experience and access training both of which help raise their individual productivity. Ultimately, investing in human capital is the key ingredient in making growth both stronger and more inclusive. And over time, such investment will help the euro area not just to converge to the productivity frontier, but also to shift it out. Each country, of course, has its own challenges. But few euro area countries are displaying high productivity growth. So there is little doubt that progress could be made almost everywhere. That is one reason why the recent five presidents report 
called for a new convergence process among euro area countries, which would move all countries towards best practices on structural reforms. What is now crucial is that we move towards a common consensus on what the necessary reforms are, how countries should be implementing them, and then that we should start this process. There are many, let me conclude, there are many understandable political reasons to delay structural reforms, but there are few, very few good economic ones, and the cost of delay is simply too high. Given the interactions between policies that I have described, it's in everyone's interest that the various trends of policy buttress each other if only because that will shorten the time it takes for each to produce its effects. And that would mean that we can bring growth back to potential before potential itself becomes damaged. All the ways to accelerate the realization of our economic potential, perhaps the simplest, is to remove the uncertainties that hamper long-term decisions and hold back investment. And speaking here in Brussels, I can only underline in this context the cost of postponing the reform of EU and Euro area governance that all agree is necessary, and by the same token, the boost to prosperity and stability that would result from removing those uncertainties without undue delay. Thank you.